Welcome to the digital podcast that explores how different organizations transform the way they create and capture value with digital technology. Welcome, everyone. My name is Eric Montero. I'm a professor in computer science at the Norwegian University of Science and, and Technology. And we have a couple of exciting guests today um, where we will explore the theme of uh, um, autonomous vessels and the experiences and, and reflections uh, around that theme from a Norwegian context. So let me introduce Jon Arne Glomsrud and Tom Arne Pedersen. Um, I think we've agreed to do the simple international version of John and Tom for today. Um, so with that, um, please, both of you, if you could you know, start by, by presenting a little bit of your own background. And I think in doing so, you should let the, the audience know a little bit about DNV, um, which in the Norwegian context is very well known, but for this audience, is likely not to be so. Yeah, maybe I should start. Uh, so my name is Jonas Lundsø. I uh, I originally uh, did the master in control engineering uh, in Trondheim, and and then uh, I joined Tom Arne for many years in in, uh, in working with simulation based testing of maritime vessels, the complex systems of maritime and drill rigs and so on. And then uh, finally we were acquired by DNV and uh, came into DNV and, and eventually research in DNV. Now DNV has a very long history in, in classing of ships. So before you can uh, have trust in the, in the ships, the seaworthiness. And it, this has extended into working with safety and certification uh, uh, and risk. Uh, but in research, you could say my, my focus is this been a lot around autonomous vessels, of course, but uh, more in general, actually complex systems, intelligent systems, and lately uh, more and more focus on digital transformation and, and even sustainable transformation, or what they call it, the uh, twin transition. Yes, uh, so my name is uh, Tom Arne Pedersen. Um, my background is uh, from NTNU, um, Marine Technology, I'm also from, from, from NTNU, also took a PhD uh, at NTNU. Uh, after my PhD I started working in a company also called Marine Cybernetics, uh, which you refer to as, as the company acquired by DNV in 2014. Uh, in MC I was uh, focusing on how to do testing uh, of the of the um, control system for drilling, BOP, uh, MPD, and so on. Um, and now uh, in research in in DNV, I'm using my background and what we have done in in marine cybernetics uh, to look into how can simulations be used uh, for testing autonomous navigation system uh, to test the, the system that is actually navigating the vessel. Um, uh, um, together with all other other kind of vessels, so so that is my main focus in um, uh, in in research here in DNV. And I think it's uh, it's relevant uh, as, as the audience here is is an international to to unpack a little. So you're hinting at drilling, which means that you know you have experience from you know the oil and gas sector, um, you know the the drilling of wells, and mm. the automation and control of 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 that, um, mm. um, and and uh, um, so so DNV is is a little you know to to uh, I think an English speaking audience is a little bit like or at least originated similar to Lloyd's, um, and but has differentiated as as you both um, explained. No, Norway looks like a very unlikely place to do a lot of work within autonomous v vessels. I mean, it's small, all the big players seem to be, you know, the big, big tech Teslas and, and the like. So, so can you, 
can you say a little bit about what, what, what's the circumstances and the conditions? Why, why, why Norway? You know, why? Uh, what, what's the what do we have going for us for for this to be a sensible place to to explore um, autonomous vessels within the marine sector? Uh, do you want to start, Jonarne, uh, or should I? Well, I, I could start my view on it. Uh, I, I think the, so the oil, uh, the sort of finding the oil uh, at the Norwegian shelf, it, it kind of kickstarted a development in Norway, both in, uh, of course, economics, but also in, in uh, knowledge and skills. So I, I, I guess that has made uh, sort of the resources and the people and the time to build up the knowledge. And obviously, we have, it's it's harsh environment. It's hard to do to do the operations. So that has ended up with uh, I, I would think uh, a lot of uh, skills around automation in, in very hard conditions or very, very challenging conditions. And and uh, autonomy is kind of just an, an uh, continuation of that, I think. Uh, and even uh, sort of uh, more re renewables, it's it's kind of the same. It's big construction, it's challenging, it's the same, at least offshore. So uh, I think this kind of line of development just continues. Yeah. Uh, I also want to uh, like to add uh, one more thing, which I think is very important. Um, I think the collaboration that we have between the different the components here in Norway is, is very good. Uh, we are not that uh, scared about sharing. Uh, are we going to succeed within uh, autonomous navigation? Uh, you cannot make that by yourself. You need to cooperate with, with others. Um, and I think that um, here in Norway, we are we're quite good at actually doing that, um, especially for us in DNV. It is quite easy to, to cooperate with uh, with Kongsberg, with ABB, with, with other big players on this. Uh, and and uh, I also believe that, that they are also in some way cooperating with each other. So, so I think that is also maybe a good uh, good thing to, to bring out that, that cooperation is important. And, and here in Norway, we are actually able to do that. And if I can just comment a little on that, because, um, you know, uh, we don't want to make this into a advertisement for Norway, but, but uh, <laughs> I, I, it's definitely, you know, the, the smallness has this quality of closeness and, and non-bureaucratic ways in which traditionally, you know, you can, you can collaborate with um, people outside your own organization in the whole industry or between academic and industrial um, partners. So, so there is a long tradition of that. But can I also, um, you know, um, uh, Ilnara, you were on to the oil and gas, but, but I think maybe, you know, specifically the, the way the role of subsea within oil and gas in Norway, which in the, con in the context of this discussion means that there is more, more revolt. So, so subsea means that it's run and operated uh, unmanned, so that is remotely. Uh, and with that, you automatically have more emphasis on remote control of, of uh, running complex industrial operations, um, literally, you know, long, long uh, way, uh, you know, different from, from, you know, from run from control centers um, on platforms or even onshore, um, which I think is particular for the Norwegian you know, version of oil and gas? Uh, when I think about it, maybe several uh, sort of challenging areas that have driven this uh, higher competence in a way. I, I agree with that. It's also that it's, it's, uh, how, what you do uh, supplying in these rigs. Well, you need to <laughs> come with ships. So you need the uh, dynamic positioning, right? Or uh, what do you do when you're getting the oil and uh, not having a, a pipe uh, to land when the, the offloading and unloading of oil? So uh, I guess there are, uh, I know in, in your 
uh, in the last years, also the more emphasis on more remote operation of the bricks itself. Yeah. So, so I guess all these are drivers for what kind of knowledge needs to move into autonomy in a way. You know, at least my, my way of thinking about this is that from these experiences that is grappling with these problems, you develop expertise and knowledge and technology to address it, which then has spillover effects as we move into autonomous vessels. And I think this is this is um, essentially a learning story. Uh, of and and um, if I can also jump in um, and, and welcome from me as well. Uh, thank, you. thank you for for being uh, with us today. Um, I guess from what I understand, Norway, uh, at least the, the the part where a lot of the marine industry is is active, sits on a very um, uh, live, uh, I guess, area where a lot of marine uh, species live. And 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 going back to Jon's uh, point about sustainable transformation and green transformation, you're also um, in uh, uh, the project of conserving and protecting uh, that environment, um, and and it's as as far as I understand, is is it is a hostile environment. It's 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 quite deep and and therefore requires unmanned operations, right? So, I think the the sustainable green parts of it, in addition to the complexity of the industry, makes this. Um, a perfect uh, case for uh, testing and experimenting with with autonomous vehicles. Yeah, um, I don't know if you want to, to comment on that, but I think it, it sort of extends what I, I said about you, you, you know, you develop further by grappling with really hard problems and the way, you know, this industry has to not only be commercially viable, but also environmentally viable, sustainable um, in, you know, difficult uh, climatic and, and, and other, uh, you know, circumstances may, um, uh, propel or, or, or encourage a kind of, of, of um, coming up with new solutions, uh, including uh, solutions in, in the autonomous uh, automation space. Um, but perhaps we, we could, um, uh, Tamarna, you, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, many smaller and not so small players in the Norwegian sort of industrial setting. But maybe we need to get a li little clearer sense of DNV's role here. So in general, there, you know, you have an interest in certification, standardization, but what motivates and drives uh, DNV's engagement in, you know, regulating, I guess, um, the future um, marine, you know, transport industry, um, partially based on autonomous vessels? Yeah, no, also it's, uh, for us, it's important that, um, that the new system or the new vessels that is coming out is as safe as as what you have out there today. Uh, it's important that, uh, of course, uh, autonomous vessel will not take over. It will not. Uh, and it will. It, it will not um, make the other vessels uh, not being there anymore. So, so it needs to be. Uh, it needs to function together with with what you have today, um, and and that is very difficult. Uh, you have, for example, the Colreg, uh, which is the rules of the road at sea which all vessel needs to comply with uh, and that will also mean that autonomous vessels will need to comply with those rules uh, and the way a vessel is navigated that is communication between the vessels that is out there uh, and if if uh, we are not able to make the autonomous vessels behaving in a way that uh, that a human will understand what is going on it will not work um, of course, we do have uh, collisions today. Uh, should we then have uh, more stricter rules for the autonomous vessels? I don't know. 
there are things that we need to, to find out. Uh, but I guess if you have a collision between autonomous vessels and uh, another vessel, you will come into a problem. Uh, so, so, um, so we are researching how sh how should we do assurance of these systems? How can we say anything about how good the systems are and, and so on? Um, yeah, exactly. I'm not sure, Jonarni, if you want to add anything there. Uh, not to add this explicitly, uh, anyway. Uh big ships on the sea, but what we also see in this kind of the increasing autonomy is that we see kind of new solutions that wasn't, uh, that were not uh, scalable or possible with many on board. So, so that's also a very exciting field, uh, much bit, uh, smaller uh, units that also need autonom autonomy. So autonomy kind of changes also the the sizes or, or, the, or the applications or whatever it is, new opportunities in a way. Mm. Um, so that's of course also relevant. Maybe it's not correct there, but it's the same principles, right? It's not always unmanned, you have the same challenge. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you mention a couple of applications uh, of autonomous vehicles just to get a sense of what kind of vessels we're talking about and, 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 and what are the kinds of problems they're trying to solve? Uh, one of the reasons, at least uh, in my mind, uh, for having autonomous vessels uh, is that the navigators that you have today, they are getting older and older and you don't have people replacing them. So, so you will need something that are able to, to do uh, similar things, but without the persons on board, because more and more persons are not that uh, interesting actually being away from their family for a long time, which is then how it is today. So, so that is one thing. Um, you could do a lot of exploration of, of the, of the seafloor, for example, with, with these kind of vessels. Uh, I just saw now in the news that uh, uh, Matterm Robotics is uh, selling uh, one autonomous vehicle to, to um, Røkke, Kjelling Røkke, uh, for doing krill or whatever it's called in English, uh, for, for, for finding very fishes. Um, so then you could have a small vessel just going around there while they are fishing other places, uh, finding out where are the fish, where should we do fishing next. So that is also one way of doing it. Um, we could do a lot, uh, which I talked about uh, previously, um, below, uh, below sea, um, for inspections, for example. That is also one area where we could use autonomous vehicles, uh, not maybe not um, um, uh, surface vessels, but still under, under water uh, vehicles. So, so there's a lot of different uh, way these vessels can be used. So, um, yeah. E even even for transportation of humans, or we were not there yet. Uh, yeah, you have companies uh, like uh, Seabus. Uh, they are now um, going to Stockholm. Uh, I think it's uh, in May or June this year, uh, where they will start with with this uh, together with Trollhatten. Um, so yes, this is coming. That would be smaller vessels uh, for 12 person passenger, approximately, uh, where they will uh, transport people for very short distances. So, so that is also coming, and and, and that will also maybe reduce the, the the need for building bridges uh, and then by that reduce the cost. Uh, in addition to being battery driven, so so it's also environmental friendly. Panos, just to, to for the benefit also of, of the listeners here or, or viewers that so there is a variety of, of different vessels. Um, there are like like Tomarna, you know, um, was on to now, you know, uh, smaller ferries or, or pe you know, transporting people or, or I guess goods and cars at one point, but uh, with experimentation of relatively small. And then there are uh, I don't think we've seen that yet, you know, larger vessels, but that's, um, you know, um, something that's being discussed. And then there are these subsea uh, vessels doing inspections, monitoring, even maintenance, repair work. Uh, and um, if you bring out a big map, uh, Panos, you can show them, you know, so the Trondheimsfjord is a bit like, uh, which is this 
area outside where, where we are now is is a bit like Arizona in, in the US, um, which is a designated testing area for autonomous uh, marine vessels. So you have both surface vessels, but also um, uh, subsea drones, underwater uh, drones, maintenance, repair, that dock um, at the bottom of the charge and dock, uh, and then can do these days inspection of pipelines is, is very much something that people are interested in, um, given last year's events. Um, so there is a variety of types of vessels and with that types of problems. Um, mm -hmm. and, and can you can you also tell us a little bit about uh, the various companies and, and I assume it's not just companies, it's also government organizations potentially that are building these autonomous vehicles. But I would I would assume given the, 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 the amount of uh, that the cost that is required of building these things probably a lot of commercial companies uh, are involved. Um, can you can you give us a sense of the ecosystem um, that is involved in this? Yes, let let me see. I know it's not that uh, the big. So I, I would uh, I would think that uh, sort of the government organization they don't have the the knowledge nor the resources to do it. They are more sort of on the regulating side. So it's more the commercial that uh, could could do this. Uh, and then of course there's a, there's a barrier around regulation because uh, going from something manned or something operated by man to something autonomous is, is a leap. Uh, actually it's, it's a big step. It's kind of a, a different challenge, so uh, so and that also holds for uh, regulation. So uh, that's maybe more where the efforts is, are, are needed from the governmental bodies to to prepare sort of the regulation to cater for for this, or or else it's uh, it will stop anyway because of uh, yeah safety, for instance, as simple as that. Because autonomous systems are sort of challenge safety too much, or we are too uncertain, and then we don't uh, open up for it from regulation. Perhaps one way of of um, trying to to get uh, to understand this more more concretely is to, I'm assuming that that most um, people outside the you know the domain of of um, you know marine vessels associate autonomous vessels with um, you know their Teslas or you know cars uh, and and obviously there are lots of similarities with autonomous vessels on the roads um, at sea but you know could, could you could you point out some some key differences technically and perhaps even regulatory wise? Yes, I could. Uh, yeah, the first thing is, um, it, it, well, Tesla is not autonomous yet. So, <laughs> and I, I would, I would think that on road, it's a really, it, it's, it's a very unstructured environment. It's really hard to, uh, yeah, <laughs> to to make an autonomous uh, car really uh, work in the traffic. So on on, on sea, it's simpler actually, and especially if you kind of. Uh, do the autonomous operation in more uh, confined uh, operative area. For instance, like this ferry that could pass for sort of a channel where you have less complexity in the operation or far out into the sea or something like that where there is less. So, in that, so that's a big, I, I would say, a profound difference in a way. It's easier to, yeah, to be able to do it. Even if uh, the, the larger ship is harder because of the consequences, right? It's, it's large, <laughs> so you don't want accidents with that. Uh, so that's uh, obvious, but uh, then again, uh, there are challenges on, well, it's inoperative, I would say. Uh, the challenges really, really are, are present. Uh, Technology-wise, of course, you can transfer. So that's really good uh, to learn from what Tesla has been doing with all their data, right? From, from all the car, the whole car fleet. Uh, but you can, yeah, you can learn at, at least. So, so that's a couple of examples, maybe. 
but, but still, uh, one thing that is important to remember is that in the car industry, you have a lot of copies of the cars. Uh, all cars are similar. Um, in the maritime industry, that is not the case. Uh, every vessel is different, uh, even though they should be the same, they are not the same. Uh, so that makes that also uh, um, make this also um, maybe not more difficult, but it's, it's difficult uh, because of this. Um, of course, you also have um, due to weather, uh, you could have potentially a lot of, of uh, movement on the vessel, which can make it difficult for the, for the camera, for the, for the LiDAR, radar, whatever you have on board for sensors for, for looking outside the vessel to, to actually work uh, properly. Um, uh, if something is happening, uh, it could be difficult to just call home and go get the vessel uh, with a car. That could be a uh, possibility. Uh, also, you don't. Um, if you have a car, maybe you could then go go to the side of the road and, and stop there, and uh, that that could be safe. Uh, at sea, you maybe don't have that possibility. So um, yeah, so it's, it's similarities, but also differences. Exactly. So, and and in, in in some respects, that makes it you know easier or or apparently easier, and and in some respects more difficult. So, so could could you um, give us a sense of then, you know, adding this up? What, what what is then the experiences to date with? Take the example of these smaller ferries. I mean, they are in prototyping and have been tried out, but could you give a Give us a sense of, of um, you know, how far from putting this into operational, uh, you know, as an operational service we are. What kind of problems is it that we still have yet to, 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 uh, um, you know, have have, have sorted, and, and and which ones do we um, have more or less control over? Yeah, I, I could I could try. Uh, you could say that uh, sort of taking a small ferry and running it over over a short distance. That's a solved problem in a way. We know how to do that because vessels have been following uh, paths, uh, predefined paths for uh, almost ages. But the problem is, what if something happens unexpectedly? What if it doesn't see what it should see, or it sees something that's not there, or sort of what happens in kind of the interaction in the in in, <laughs> in the not always ideal operation in a way. And this is the information you don't have up front. You couldn't think your properly think through all the scenarios. You couldn't think about all the effects. Uh, so it's maybe a, it's the same challenge as maybe Tesla is trying to do with all their cars. They are gathering so much data and trying to sort of um, scrape out or what you call it, uh, sort of the key behavior or the key sort of things to consider and uh, observe and, and, and move around in a way. Um, so, so I guess that's the same challenge with uh, let's say this this ferry is to gather this data so you can trust it. Gather it to see if you have thought the right way with your control system and do an adjustment, 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 really, until you're uh, confident that this really is autonomous. And that journey will take some time. But that doesn't mean you couldn't um, deploy it and use it, but you rather should think about how you do that deployment or and gradually maybe increase the, what do you call it, the autonomous capability or, or, or authority or sort of, yeah, in a way. So, so you mentioned, you mentioned data and I guess, um, a lot of the machine learning capabilities or intelligent capabilities of these autonomous vehicles depend on the data that you collect, right? And I, I, a couple of I have a couple of questions on that, but let's start with first. Um, I, I assume that because these are commercial applications, usually the companies that own the the hardware uh, also manage the the software, and and they are responsible for collecting the data for their own applications, right? Um, 
but are there any regulations that um, encourage sharing of data for the better management of these vehicles in a collective manner? And I'm thinking here, you know, if you have multiple autonomous vehicles in a particular area, you want them to collaborate, right? You want to avoid accidents. You want to um, make them work uh, in a way that uh, follow the same, I guess, traffic signals in the sea, etc. So, so are there any regulations that encourage um, collaboration between companies on the sharing of data in order to improve and optimize operations? Not that I'm aware of. I think it's the opposite, that it's okay. too little understanding of that would really be a benefit to share the data. And you could think about Tesla. I think they sit on the data and do not share it. Right? <laughs> and one example. And uh, I uh, and also I do feel that sort of the data, at least for 10 years ago, we thought about big data. And then, and then everybody wanted value from their data and protecting their data instead of sharing it and, and see the common benefits. So maybe we are still too much in that way of thinking that data is potential value, so let's protect it instead of sharing and, and, uh, and get external value. So um, regulation should cater for it. Uh, we might maybe doing some research on trying to sort of put together different data for the common purpose, uh, but uh, not enough. Yeah, I have additional comment there. I uh, totally agree with you, Jonarne. Um, I talked about previously that uh, in Norway we are good at, at sharing and collaborating, but maybe not on data. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but uh, in DNV, we are also looking into, is it possible to then simulate that kind of data? So we are still able to to, to verify and test uh, the detection, tracking and so on by using simulated data instead of real data. But of course, um, you also need data to, to actually be able to, to validate that it's possible to use simulated data. Uh, there in the, in the car industry, you have a lot more data. You have a lot more cars that are able to gather all this data when it comes to the maritime industry, not that much. So, so um, there we are lacking behind, absolutely. Yeah, that's that, that was exactly what I was thinking, what you mentioned just now. I guess with Tesla, they have so many cars driving around the, wor the, the, the roads that they're collecting the data, they're engaging in federated learning, and then updating their software as they're going along because they have millions of drivers, right? Mm, mm. Whereas in, in your case, the amount of autonomous vessels is, is quite small. Therefore, you require some kind of regulatory intervention, I would think, some kind of open API as we had in uh, open banking in Europe a few years ago where you essentially open up these platforms, right? Mm. I would call them platforms. Um, um, in sharing specific types of data for the common good. Obviously, some data would have to be protected, uh, but I guess some other types of data could be used for common uh, uses. Well, I think that's, uh, that could be a good idea. Um, since, you are, since we have so few system or vessels that are out there gathering data, uh, yeah, you need, we need to share. We need to be able to, to share this data to... to um, to be able to succeed. So, so um, totally support uh, such a, a way of working or, or doing it. But uh, as of now, I don't think uh, that is in place. But some of the, the you know, I, I walk past the harbor from, from time to time, you know, they have the test vessels, the prototypes for autonomous vessels have, you know, they all have DNV and Kongsberg and, and, you know, some of the main, you know, as, as sponsors. So, so apparently, at least for the prototypes, you are, collectively I and mean, the data you do have that data from the prototype or yeah yeah uh, for for you do have uh and the new has this milliampere uh, and then and the new is is uh, owning that that kind of that data uh but i don't i don't think that they have come up with a a good way of actually sharing all those data um we have a very small uh small vessel, autonomous vessel, uh, called Revolt, uh, which should also get a lot of uh, data, both camera data, ladder data, and, um, 
uh, and uh, camera LiDAR and radar. Uh, maybe one of the problems is also that there are a huge amount of data. So it's difficult to, to get that on a, on a platform or whatever, which can actually be shared. So, so that is also a problem, um, which we don't have a solution on. But for the Revolt data, all those data are open for all the students that are working on it and all students that want to have those data. Um, but since that vessel is so small uh, and, and the vessel is moving or rolling that much, it's not useful for using that data for commercial use. So, so uh, but otherwise, it, it, it is open. I guess it's, it's quite uh, early in the maturity of the industry uh, that's uh, at least that's how I understand it in the way that you're describing it, that it, th there aren't a lot of public facing applications like, I don't know, collecting data about the weather, about the swell for sailing or for, for fish, for fishing or for other types of um, uses that the public would be very much interested in. And, and, and then there would be a drive or a demand for these uh, software developers to develop these applications that would connect to the sensors and so on and so forth. And that would create some kind of momentum because at the moment it sounds like it's primarily commercial, big commercial organizations in oil and shipping, marine, right? That uh, are very protective <laughs> of, of, the, of their space. Therefore, there isn't a lot of demand for these additional public um, applications that would allow for this type of data sharing. Mm. At least that's the way I understand it. I don't know if I'm wrong, but please correct me. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm thinking that with it, data and data. So one thing is data from sort of testing the technology itself. Yeah. But another real, real need is data about, you, you, as Tom said, we need to simulate because we, we don't get the, the real data. In, in, so it, it's not enough. No, nothing the interesting stuff doesn't happen there you, for safety you need to test a lot of other scenarios so it's kind of we need data about the operative and and uh, i guess still the data available around is, is still limited in a way and uh, for instance one vendor couldn't uh, be trusted uh, alone saying that, well, our, our vessel is safe because we have tested it, right? Uh, we have tested it so many, you need some kind of independence and that's why DMV is, has, has a role. We don't make the system, we try to certify them. Uh, so there is a need for some, maybe there is a need for some op operative data. How do you know, uh, sort of, let's say all the data you need to test the collision avoidance uh, system of, of these ships. That's a common problem for everyone. So that, there you see my, maybe a role that DNB and other our competitors actually could serve trying to establish some kind of common uh, benchmarking for collision avoidance. There you see some kind of um, data set that could be uh, <laughs> open and, and uh, across all the commercial interests in a way because it is in the interest of all actors tom you mentioned you mentioned earlier um the use of synthetic data um, are you are you in uh, collaboration with any companies that are producing this synthetic data exactly to address uh these challenges that jon is is is, is mentioning uh, yes, we are. Uh, we are collaborating with a Finnish company called AI Lysim. Um, they are mainly making these synthetic data to train uh, AI systems. Uh, but we are now also looking into can these systems be, or these, these data be used for, for testing, uh, detection and tracking? Uh, how can we introduce the different kind of weather and so on? So that is things that we are exploring together with them. So, so yes, we are. Are, are doing that. Uh, in addition, you have um, NTNU has developed uh, Gemini, uh, a similar kind of, of, of um, um, visualization tool uh, to generate data for radar, LiDAR and camera. Uh, so, so, so yeah, so we are in, in cooperation with several that are making tools for doing this. Uh, but but as, but we have just started, so we don't know yet if if it will be sufficient. So 
I think if I if I put on my university hat, I I think we are in a situation where, um, due to at one level a kind of market failure, you know, in this early stage of innovation processes, there is a need for a kind of public good type of, you know, a collect, you know, some more or less neutral entity who could 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 help. Um, create a kind of platform of available data across different vendors and competitors. You know, universities have, have traditionally had such a role, but it could be DNV or other, you know, public governmental type of, of entities. I mean, we, we started off commenting on the oil and gas. And, and of course, one of the interesting things with, with the Norwegian oil and gas uh, history is the way data about oil and gas on the on the shelf was made publicly available what was this was made um you know politicians and institutions made that clear from the very beginning which means that different from the us where where uh, you know the, the the companies own their own data there was a the oil data is public good and and you could do you could think a similar thing that autonomous marine vessel data should be public good uh, and then later down the line you could do commercialization mm -hmm. i guess the oil and gas industry and i would also think the the shipping industry they, they, they have very big players right i mean big companies that definitely have the capacity to make investments towards this direction so i i think on the one hand you're very innovative uh obviously on a par with other countries but because of your smaller scale you require this big time investments um to push this forward and and i wonder whether uh you know what are the incentives what what are the incentives for these big commercial players to come in and and act um on the basis that you just described perhaps not as individual companies but as consortia uh, that would be able to fund um, the testing and validation of uh, these autonomous vehicles in different scenarios? My personal feeling is that it's maybe... We have some big players in our, uh, on, on the maritime system, like Kongsberg. And it's maybe very costly and hard to drive that alone, especially for autonomy. So they need, uh, they also need help, right? Uh, so I, maybe that's a, that's incentive. Not it's such a hard problem that uh, you actually maybe you don't even succeed fast enough for whatever you do because of the sort of the burden of trying to solve the problem a little bit too much alone. I'm not saying that they are not cooperating, but autonomy is such a problem in my view. Uh, now they are not the only one because, uh, as Tom was mentioning about uh, smaller, smaller autonomy solutions, so we have other players that kind of not competing with them, but they are uh, understanding the autonomous challenge and anyway and sort of progressing. So uh, of course, uh, to go together and solve the autonomy problem, maybe even outside the maritime, that could be good because you see autonomy below the surface, on, on the surface, in, in the air, maybe in, in the construction, in the agriculture, and so on and so on. They have similar problems. Yeah. Um, just to want to add one, one thing here. Um, you could also see is, say that the technology that is used for, for making vessels uh, autonomous, uh, those are not specific for, uh, for big vessels. It's the same technology used for smaller vessels. Uh, um, DNV, we are not used to classing vessels that are small passenger ferries. They are too small. Uh, but still, we are working towards those kind of vessels because, yeah, there is there the the the, the uh, yeah, they are doing a lot there now, uh, and and a lot is happening um, uh, when it comes to technology, when it comes to how they are doing things and so on. So, so we need to be there to learn to, to find out how we are going to, to do assurance of these things. Uh, and then this will be brought to, to, to the, uh, into the, to the um, yeah, bigger part of the bigger vessels uh, in, in the maritime industry. 
So, so what you're describing is uh, it's quite interesting, actually. It, it resonates very much with disruption of innovation theory. <laughs> Eric, you probably associate with that. You know, there's the big incumbents that have, you know, a lot of physical assets, big assets that they very difficult to turn around, you know, and uh, they are relying on these smaller companies to innovate new solutions. Uh, and, and, but, but they're often, you know, very hesitant to make those investments because they're too worried about their everyday operations. Uh, and there's this <laughs> pull and push, uh, right? Uh, do I go with the new innovation or do I keep doing what I'm doing? And do I wait for the new company to come out and eventually, I don't know, maybe buy them or, uh, if I'm unlucky, I get disrupted completely and I, and I lose, <laughs> uh, my position in the market, which is, it sounds very similar to what you are describing. So I guess it, it does come back to incentives and, and you as the, the regulator in this space, I think have an important role to play in this, uh, you know, how do you bring all these different parties together? Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> And the NBA is also kind of in in some markets very big player and having the same problem. <laughs> okay. Like other big ones, right? <laughs> we continue doing what we do or do we follow the disrupt what disruptive digital ways? <laughs> so yeah, these uh, topics are yeah. When when we have a when we have a solution in, in a closed formula upon us, we'll come back and we can make a lot of money. <laughs> when, when to be conservative and when to... Um, no, but I, I, I also think that, that you know, what, what you're describing is, is very interesting also in the... Uh, I think one of the aspects um, uh, in my head of, of digital transformation is that the days when you could go alone are, are seemingly, you know, gone. Now it's the transformation of the whole industry, of the whole sector. Mm. So we're not, of course, the various players here, here adopt technology in, in different uh, pace and, 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 you know, but it's, it's really creating an institutional technical regulatory framework for the whole marine industry as such to to move ahead and, and there's a sort of deadlock in that to get there we need to learn more by among others collect the data which is now dispersed and spread and, and um, but we then need to persuade people to make the upfront investment and sharing for future down the line um, payoff. Um, and, and that's what I meant by, by a kind of market failure because you know the, the, um, you need sort of long-term investment plans and, and few are, are able to do that, which is uh, often the case where, where governmental, regulatory, academic intervention happens, research as offloading some of the risks of, of uh, developing that. Um, um, so I, I want to maybe um, touch on this point of, of, of value. And I, I think this is what Eric was talking about, right? How, I mean, obviously these different um, stakeholders, ecosystem actors, whatever you want to call them, they, they see different value in um, investing in autonomous vehicles, right? I, I think some of them maybe see it more uh, in, in terms of more sustainability, right? Uh, maybe others see it maybe for cost efficiency, um, uh, you know, optimization and so on. So there's different notions of value here. And um, again, it, it comes back to how do you, uh, you know, approach these different stakeholders to convince them of the type of value um, that they can gain by participating in this yeah you are touching on uh, on so something is more close to my heart in the research actually uh really trying to uh, sort of coming from originally we were we are concerned about the technical systems in a way to check to see where the store ship 
and then we forget too too much about we really receive the value from running this trip. Uh, but in a more sustainable uh, sort of drive, uh, it's because of regulation needs and so are coming up, so you need to think wider. So it's, so to me, it's obvious you really need to think about what what value is this technology giving and who receives that value. Uh, also, uh, are there any harm we should uh, reduce? And then you can think quite far, actually. Uh, if you go to the EU Act on AI, it's the same. Uh, how do you secure an ethical use of AI? You really need to think way beyond the commercial interest or, or the direct user or whatever. You need to think about the effect. So, so uh, at least to me, it's obvious we need to think about the, the sort of those impacted or those really receiving the value from this di digital technology. Uh, obviously, also those making the technology and profiting on that, they are just part of the, of, the, of the picture. So to me, it's obvious we need to think further about the, 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 yeah, the outcomes. Tom? Well, I think the, the comment from you and Arne was, uh, was good. Um, one additional thing. Um, if you go, if you narrow down to, to the systems and so on, um, we I would say DNV is not the one that are are, are convincing the, the companies of for, for doing this. Uh, we are more here to to um, help help them out uh, to succeed in doing this. Uh, so so um, the demand for for these autonomous vessels, uh, if you're looking at into also unmanned, because autonomous doesn't imply unmanned, but um, uh, uh, it's possible to reduce at least the, the crew. Um, as I said in the beginning, uh, there are fewer and fewer people that want to be uh, sailors and, and, and are able to, and, and if you want to still continue uh, transporting goods and, and people, uh, you will need to do something. And autonomy is, is, is at least one thing that can be done to, to help this. Uh, also, to be able to reduce the speed of the vessels. Uh, of course, the transport will take much longer time, and then it will be extremely boring being on board that vessel. So that is also things that will help on by making it unmanned and autonomous. So um, yeah, but still, we are not the one that are driving this, uh, but we want to help them succeed when they are going in this direction. And, and I guess I would think um, from the little that I know of Norway, the, the public is quite uh, also environmentally conscious and and I wonder whether pressure from the public um, to uh, adopt these types of technologies um, would also help with the transformation of the of the whole industry right I mean if the pub if the public is requesting for more and more of these changes even even for families that have sailors as you say right I mean and they don't want their family members to be long gone in the sea and, and they could be reskilled, uh, you know, with new skills that would allow them to be on shore and, and manage these ve vessels uh, remotely. Um, these are the types of incentives, I guess, you would give to the public in order to put pressure back to the industry, right? And, um, but I understand, I mean, your role is primarily a standardization body uh, and not you're not playing the role of the government, but obviously you you can um, inform the government of these types of uh, transform transformative potential of the technology, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but the, the, the comment that the, the, the typical sort of a service, gener generic service from, from DMA would be that we, we kind of think about the consequences and risks with the technology. And already there, you can think much more widely about the consequences of this exact, exact like autonomous vessel. What are the consequences? And you could cover these consequences also, as you as you discussed on different stakeholders. And then you make a more balanced picture about the outcomes, right? And then you can at least try to uh, to make the technology serve all those more varied goals in a way, or different or maybe even opposing goals, right? And then it may fit better <laughs> into society. <laughs> uh, before it was uh, early, it was easy. It was kind of 
ship is a ship and it needs to be safe out on the Norwegian continental shelf and that's it. Uh, there were man not many stakeholders there in a way. <laughs> it was simple. But uh, other digital solutions are not that simple. They involve much more of the society in a way, and then you need to think much more widely around the risks and outcomes. But maybe this is a good way of, of closing um, with the society, and, and I think this illustrates the way you know starting with something apparently you know small and tiny and technical, you know, um, algorithms for autonomous entities um, but uh, recognizing it as, as um, you know the task to be addressed at very many levels you know including a kind of societal public level yeah well thank you both for uh, making the time uh, to talk to us uh, I really learned a lot from this conversation and I, I know you have a, a big challenge ahead of you but uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, a challenge uh, uh, that is well deserved and uh, I'm sure these autonomous vehicles will be uh, more routine uh, in, in a few years time uh, if, if, if not uh, earlier. Um, but thank you so much. Um, this, this has been fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having us.